Can anybody hear me? All right. They're not on. Hello. Yeah. Hello. You. Okay. What? Hello. Hi, everybody. Everybody can hear me now. Okay. I am really so happy to see everybody in the audience today. I do um, want to tell you that we are going to really encourage everybody to keep masks up. Our speaker is going to take down masks just to make that a little bit easier for everybody. Um, and if you have issues with that and need to change your seats, this is a good time to do that. Okay. Um, my name is Carolyn Brown. I am um, chair of the Department of Computer Sciences and Computer Sciences. <laughs> Communication. It it, ha, it has been it has been a um, long year already, and we're in the first week. But enough about me. I'm I'm chair of the department. I've known Anne for a, a very very long time, and I'm really happy to welcome everybody here. And um, I have a, a couple words I wanted to say, so I didn't use up all her time. I wrote them down. So. Today, we're here to help Anne celebrate her retirement from the University of Iowa. Many of us have known Anne for decades, honestly, decades. And this moment is a little bittersweet. Um, I promised that I would not take long. So for the youngsters in the crowd, and you know who you are, I wanna make sure that you know just how much of Anne's life she has spent in these hallways where you guys are spending time. So Anne grew up in North Liberty not too far from here. She graduated, I have access to her uh, file from when she was an undergraduate here. <laughs> she graduated near the top of her high school class, not at the top, but quite near the top of her high school class in 1974. That sick, you know that. And a year, la <laughs> and a year later, um, she enrolled at the University of Iowa, en enrolled later that same year at the University of Iowa. In 1975, she sat in this very room and took the intro class. And she, of course, earned an A in that class. In fact, Anne's academic record was nearly spotless. You won't be surprised to know that she was an honor student in this department. Do we have some honor students here? I bet we do. She was an honor student in this department and Richard Herdig was her mentor many years ago. I know there's a few people here who remember Richard too. In 1977, Hugh Morris nominated her for an outstanding honor student at the university level, which is kind of amazing, really. And she won it for that. I think she won $100 for that. Um, she also graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1978. Richard Herdig served as a reference, and I happen to have the letter that he wrote for you for graduate oh school. Gosh, and he notes, he started by noting that Anne Calouse, her name before she became Wallace, is among the finest students we have ever had, and no doubt will be at the top of the class in whatever graduate studies she pursues. Hmm. So once again, though, Anne opted to stay put and stay in Iowa City. So she started the MA program in the summer at the beginning of the summer in 1978, and she graduated at the end of the summer in 1979. They were pretty speedy back then, I think. Um, also with a really stellar record, I might note. Anne and Bill traveled around the Midwest for a little while, um, but finally, as many of us do, she migrated, they migrated back to Iowa City to settle down. And in 1984, she joined the faculty of this department. Um, as a clinical supervisor, I'm not exactly sure what the title was, but it was clinical supervisor, I think, at the time. She spent the last 37 years teaching countless generations of graduate students, both speech pathology and audiology students, and how to best serve clients with a range of different speech and hearing disorders. Hers has been a long and distinguished career, and none of us want to see her leave. We are grateful that she has agreed to speak one last time, and so... I'm happy to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, Ann Wallace. Okay. And it's okay, this is coming off. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, one last time here, unless I still have to come to Carolyn's class, she claims, until she retires. Okay, I think I got it, Josh. Let's see. No, no. He's not doing this. Is this 
down here or yeah i'll just use it i'll do the other okay Ooh, what'd you do there all right that's what i did before okay here we go thank you to begin so i want to thank everybody trying to do a little sign language in there just thank you for coming um this is kind of uh and we want to maybe turn hit these lights a little bit here okay so let's see what we want here no all right that a little better let's see okay Okay, uh, do I need to do both or no? Okay. Okay, I, you see I'm hitting this and nothing's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right, here's what I plan to tell you, professorial wise. I'll say a little bit back, we're gonna go back a little bit in history, um, talk a little bit about life here as a graduate student. For those of you that are current graduate students, what it looked like many moons ago. Um, a little bit about what I've done, part of the things in terms of my 37 years here at the University of Iowa relative to clients and service, um, and then looking to the future. So uh, that's a little bit bittersweet, a little bit exciting, and a little bit, I have a little trepidation. So we'll get started. Anybody have questions as you go along, feel free to in interrupt me. Those of you that have had me in class before know I love a good question. I usually try to provide an answer, but I'm happy to um, actually, yes. Oh, oh, okay. Microphone for any questions. Thanks, Jean. Okay, anything else we need to do here? All right, Josh, I'm hoping it's going. All right, here we go. Um, okay, any questions? So I didn't always want to be a speech language pathologist. I actually started the university as a mathematics and pre-med major. Um, and uh, that lasted for a couple semesters. I was one of those nerds that loved, Kathy will love this, I loved organic chemistry. I loved a good carbon chain. You could do things with carbon chains. You could, and I was really good at, um, at the chemical labs, okay? I could make a lot of things in chemistry class. So I really liked organic chemistry, but I took, started taking classes at, um, here and I got involved in the physics of sound class. And I really liked that. And um, cause I wanted to be a developmental pediatrician. That was my goal initially. And, um, and so I didn't make that, but I took it another kind of direction. Um, it was really difficult for me to figure out. So in our field, for those of you that don't know, there's speech language pathology, which has to do with working with speech sound disorders, language problems, various kinds of problems like that. And then the audiology piece. And I was kind of stuck in between. I'd been mentored by Dr. Julia Davis and her daughter is here today um, and in oral rehabilitation. And I'd been mentored by Richard Hurtig in um, psycholinguistics and language and more abstract areas. And I liked them both. And my thesis was with um, Richard. Um, and we did a, a visual perception study using tachistoscopes um, of looking at part whole perceptions relative to visual icons. Um, that's for you, Richard. I know he's coming to this listening. OK, um, words have power, example one. So I'm going to give you a couple of these today. So when I was trying to decide, do I want to be a speech language pathologist? Do I want to be an audiologist? I took a hearing loss and audiometry class where, um, and I was kind of acting up a little bit in the booth, making up my own little spondy words um, it, just when we were practicing. But um, in any event, um, the, the TA there, I was having trouble with the concept of masking, which is presenting one sound in one ear and, and you're able to respond in another ear, you're trying to take the sound out. And um, my TA so graciously said, if you cannot understand a simple concept like masking, you are way too stupid to be an audiologist. <laughs> And so I said, okay, um, and so I, I'll do something else. And, um, it, but it, the, it turns out, so when I tell that to audiologists, they go, it's the most complicated concept. Like that is not an easy concept. So it, words have power, I changed course, but I kind of bridged the gap by being in a little bit in the hearing world and a little bit in the speech world for really most of my career. Um, I wanted to show students, so graduate school, okay, there's unrest all the time. 
Okay, in the 70s, it was like crazy. There's bombing out of the Iowa Book and Supply windows on the weekends. Um, it was tumultuous times here to be a student on this campus. Um, and, but tuition was 429 for a semester. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's probably just your parking for whatever. So it was, it was a lot cheaper. Um, but remember, we got paid my first job, I got paid $12,000. Okay, so it's a different, different kind of different kind of world. So um, I want to give you a little bit of comparison, what was the same experience then when compared with how it is now. So the admission was competitive, same for what you have now, hundreds of students vying for a few number of spots. And um, we, the leaders in the profession um, were in this building. So if you go downstairs and you're on the first floor when you get some food after this, there's a bunch of heads on the wall and the heads on the wall, and apparently I'm gonna be on the wall too at some point, head on the wall. But the people on the wall there were the people that were leading the field. They started it in speech science and hearing science and audiology and neurology to be working. And they, those were my teachers when we started out. So I was super lucky to have that, that kind of experience. Um, we had lots of rotation, same as what the students have kind of now. We had clinic and class all year round. Um, what was different, the big one at the top should be in huge letters, was access to information. We had to remember everything. We had to go to the library. We had to call people if we wanted things we couldn't necessarily just Google. Uh, we couldn't, there was no Google. We didn't even have a cell phone. So we couldn't do any of that kind of, uh, it was definitely old school. You read it, you looked at it. Um, as uh, graduate students, we had clinical reports that we individually typed. They were usually about eight pages, single space. And we had a rule. And I couldn't remember if it was three or five mistakes you could make. And there was this magic stuff called whiteout okay, that you could use, we could either make three or to five mistakes. And if we made a mistake like that, we had to start over. Oh, so you can, you got on the last line, you know, you're ready to type it. And then, you know, you couldn't spell and, and then you got to start over. So it was, it was difficult to do. Technology was really very different. There were not CIs when I first started. And that's what I turned out to spend a lifetime kind of studying in terms of my profession. So um, people that look, worked with AACs, Alternative Augmentative Communication Devices, they were much more streamlined, they were simpler, and nothing like what is available because technology has advanced so much. There was no media center, people. Okay, we made all our own materials in the evening, very late. And we would, um, we had little carols that we all had, carols or offices. And sometimes we'd sleep in those at night because we were making materials for the next day. And um, so that is a whole different thing. We, we had all our readings in the health science library. How many of you have been to the health science library? Raise your hands. Okay, that's more than I thought. Okay, um, uh, but we were always at the health science library. In fact, some of us had like our designated carols at the health science library. Um, this is something that doesn't happen very often. We had Saturday makeup content days. So if the professor got behind in, in some form, um, we, we had to come in on Saturdays and they would lecture till they made the content where they wanted it. We had a lot of, see how many of you are not liking that? Okay, we did that regularly. So it wasn't an option that you could say, well, no, I'm not coming. So we had those makeup content days. Um, okay, not all of it was work. So, um, and, and none of you will know who this is, except if you're older like me. Okay, Roseanne Rosanna Dana is um, on Saturday Night Live. Okay, I played her in a uh, Wendell Johnson talent show. Okay, and um, and I was pretty good. I, I mean, I, I had I had the Bronx accent. I had the thumbs going. And um, anyway, so um, we did. We went skiing one time a weekend. A lot of these are my um, actually uh, supervisors. So Mick uh, is on the far left there. I'm going to tell you a story about Mick. Mick became a, a professor and chair at Western Michigan University. In this particular picture, he was supervising me in a stuttering practicum, but we are skiing in Afton Alps and, and we went for a two day thing, we went there. Person taking the picture is Jim Curtis. 
down on the wall. Okay, he was the acoustics professor. So, and he was an older gentleman at the time, probably my age, um, but he was skiing with us. And he had, I remember his skis were like 300 feet long. They were really long skis. And Mick was the one. So in stuttering, you learn to do things called uh, one of the uh, principles, forward moving speech. So you're trying to get your patient to continue to be producing speech, even if some of it is uneven for various ways. Um, stuttering people, I'm not doing that perfectly. But so I called this, Mick was worrying on my FMS, not forward moving speech, but forward moving skiing. Okay. And what he did was he said, I watched you go down the hill. Why do you stop at the top of every hill? Okay. Cause I said, I'm sizing up what I gotta, what I gotta do, like where I gotta go. What's the easiest way down. And he said, you're not going to do that again because we're going to go up until you stop doing that. And so I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you, if you stop at the top of any hill, I am going to, his words were ski up your back, only he didn't use the word back. Okay. So um, I, I was like, whoa, okay. So he's like 250. I'm this little, you know, runt. And so I said, so I did learn how to do that. I learned how to do, to not stop at the top of the hill. I still stop when I'm over, but I learned to at least do that. So not all of it is about speech. Some of it's about having fun. You guys uh, will have an opportunity to do that in graduate school as well. Okay, true or false? Was Ann Wallace potentially um, involved in a felony? How many think true? Okay, a lot of hands went up. Yep, okay. The answer is true. So I'll tell you a quick story about that. Julia Davis, Ann Suter Davis is right here, her daughter. Um, we were, I was a graduate student and we had, um, there was something going on in the clinic and Anne could sign well. So she said, do you know how to, Anne, do you know how to drive a stick? I said, oh yeah, I learned on a stick. I know how to drive a stick. And um, she said, I need you to go pick up my daughter, also named Anne, at our, at our house. I go, okay, no problem, I'll go get her. So she, I get, she said, it's the parking lot right next to the, um, uh, whatever, out, in the, out by the uh, field or the football field. And she said, second row over, five cars in, yellow Toyota, kicked in bumper, says City High Little Hawks on the right side. Okay, so I go find it, get in. But I thought, well, that's odd. It's not a stick. It's, a, <laughs> it's an automatic. So I get all the way out. And then I'm driving out there. The car was a piece of crap. And I remember thinking, it's really terrible that this chair doesn't get paid enough to have a decent car and so I get out there to the house and honk and comes out and um, I go it's so through the window she sees the I couldn't figure out how to unlock the door like where the little lock was so I'm like saying how do you open that door and she says back whose car is this <laughs> So that was a problem. So I, I mean, like, it's amazing, but I stole a car, drove it. And then the worst is I had to park it like three blocks from where. So it was, so the person would have come to their car, thought they'd, you know, had a stroke. And then it's like, we're talking way away. Then we had to call the police and the whole thing. But yeah, so not everything exciting always happened in the classroom. Sometimes it happened outside the classroom. Okay, we are trying to develop, when we have students here, we're trying to develop professional decision-making skills right from the very beginning. And here is a nightmare practicum device that was used when I was in graduate school. This is a little clicker. Tony Selig had a picture of it still. I'm sure I purged mine right away, threw them away. But we had in practicum a uh, when we had cleft palate practicum, a certain kind of approach called um, the McKay Bradley approach. And the idea was to get multiple reps, as in to get between two and 300 repetitions per 50 minute session from each kid. Okay. And remember, we were making all our own materials at night. So that's a lot of different materials that you have to use. So, so if you had a group of two, you had four, you know, kind of clickers going, uh, like two, one positive, one negative on, on each one here. So a couple of weeks into it, I thought, okay, and I was ready to graduate. I already had a job lined up. I was going to get married in about three weeks. 
And I said, I'm just going to say I, I would like to try something different. I'd like to try a little something different to try to do that. And um, what I was told was, uh, was seared in my memory for the rest of my life. Um, my supervisor, who is not on the wall downstairs, that said this to me, said, um, you question too many things and you will never amount to anything professionally. A little harsh. Okay. Um, however, and after I got done blubbering and then I called my fiance at the time, my husband now, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to graduate because she said I'm failing. And, you know, and, you know, it was a little bit odd Then when I pulled myself together and recognized, well, now that's just a little bit crazy that now I'm getting an F and I've never had one in my life. Okay. And suddenly I was failing everything three weeks before I graduated. So, um, the point is, again, words are powerful. So words are very powerful, what, what people say. And I told myself if I was ever in a position to be a clinical supervisor, ever, 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 I would never make anyone feel anything but enriched by what you were saying, okay? It doesn't mean you didn't teach them things and sometimes they felt a little, uh -huh, not so great, but you still had to make them be able to do this in such a positive way. So. I worked in public schools in various places. I fast forward back to 1984 um, after my grades were acceptable. Carolyn, right? No. Uh, anyway, and so I started in a department and was called the professional scientific set. That perky little pink thing in the middle is me long ago. And um, so this is in the 80s. Um, so um, we're teaching families over there, families of deaf children. We used to have weekend programs that they came to. Um, here, I'm clearly using my hands to tell some story. Um, this student here um, actually graduated in our program and then went on to law school. And I have since um, done some um, work for him when he has cases that, that are um, challenging relative to kind of outcomes of babies, et cetera. So um, you connections, you keep getting those. So um, here's what we didn't have. We had no fat cell phones. We had no computers had no internet. So if you just try to think about that for a second, how difficult that was and how and actually how different that would be, All right? Um, you can get things in a second on your phone or whatever. So what impact? Well, the client care was different, right? We could only do so much. Technology was simpler. Um, but the positive thing was we could see anybody we wanted to in the clinic. I like that approach. We could see anybody that we wanted. There were not insurance rules, et cetera, the same as, as are, are currently happening and, and the things that are necessary to have now. Any kind of resources we wanted. So, for example, at the American Speech and Hearing Association, the Iowa Speech and Hearing Association, University of Iowa, UIHC, our other colleagues, you had to call them. You had to call them or go there. That's the only way you could have make that connection or write them a letter, right? So you had, that's the only way we really did that. We were at the library all the time. We had paper journals. So, uh, you know, you, some of you probably have never had paper. We had racks of paper journals in our offices that we used. Um, at this point, still in the mid eighties, there were no cochlear implants in children or really more sophisticated processing capabilities for hearing aids. I'd never taken a cochlear implant course and whoops, suddenly I'm going to be responsible for caring for that. And here, and I can tell you this person's name because it, he has been in the news. So my first positive experience with someone with a cochlear implant is named Tim, I uh, called him Timmy, Tim Brandau. And he was three years old, the first cochlear implant patient at the hospital. There is Timmy up there with Bruce uh, Gans, Dr. Bruce Gans, otolaryngologist that did his implant, cochlear implant. And uh, Timmy's sitting on Bruce's lap here and Bruce is sitting on Timmy's lap here. Uh, later, um, uh, Tim became an engineer, and um, so the well, smart guy. I knew this kid was going to be a great little, uh, great little user because at three, when they first connected and first stimulated the um, uh, his device, I was trying to get his attention. He was wandering away from me, and I was trying to call him back, Timmy, Timmy, and he looked over his shoulder, shook his head, no, like no. Nah. <laughs> Uh, so I thought, okay, I like a feisty kid. So that was, I mean, that was, that was really good. So this changed everything in terms of the, the kind of hearing speech world. 
Um, now we have audiology students and speech students. So we have Sam and Haley there from this summer, this little guy, they're doing a kind of a listening check. We have them integrated working together. We've had a long standing program. Up until early 2000, the, artic the um, uh, audiology students were required to do separate articulation, so speech sound and language practicum. They hated it. They hated it so, so, so much. And it was hard to motivate the big people by that. I mean, the graduate students. Um, and so they were really, really thankful they weren't in speech pathology usually. Um, we had one student once just to tell a story who's, it's doubly complicated when you don't speak English as your first primary language. So we had a young man here from Taiwan who was an audiology student, spoke Mandarin, and he um, was trying to, I, I was supervising his work and he was working with a little preschooler and he wanted to figure out the animal sounds. He was reading this kid a little book, but he didn't know for sure what sounds sounded like in English. So he would ask me like, what do American cows say? Okay. <laughs> So I said, you know, moo. And what do American horses say? Nay, whatever. And what do American dogs say? Woof, woof. Okay. And then one of the um, icons in there was a um, frog. And he said, what do American frogs say? And I said, ribbit. I said, what do they say in, uh, in um, Taiwan? He said, frogs don't talk in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so I will, I will never forget that. Um, I don't know what they say, but they don't say that. So... Okay, for me in this position, it's really about connections. So you can see colleagues, we go to conferences and present, et cetera. We have these giant badges on over there. This was, um, where were we there, guys? Um, I can't remember. What is it? Okay. Orlando. Okay. And here, no, I know we were at Lopsy there. <laughs> um, so another program that we've started recently for students to try to get them sort of connected on the campus and interacting with each other, first year, second years, audiology students, as well as faculty, is in a little more casual environment. And so not sure why I'm the only one wearing long sleeves, but, and it was really hot. But anyway, um, we were in this giant chair at WAPSI and over there just at professional conferences. So for me, connections are extremely important. Um, here we are, this is our 40th graduate school reunion in 2019, right before COVID. Um, I seem to be leading the pack there at the front. This is this is down at um, the in the lobby downstairs, and uh, and some of my colleagues from uh, 40 years ago. So you two will have those pictures to kind of look at and um, to cherish. So it's pretty fun. Different levels of connections that we have. So in the department and outside the department. So Joya on the left there, my mentor to begin with. Um, Richard, three over from there um, in terms of how I started here, but lots of uh, people kind of in between. And last but certainly not least, Carolyn Brown there on the far right. And so I've worked also with scores of emeriti faculty, adjunct faculty, instructors, teachers. I see some of my SLP colleagues here from all across the community um, and teachers that are here as well. So you make lots of, lots of connections. And then you've got your people that you're with every single day. So your clinical colleagues here at Wendell Johnson, speech language pathology and audiology, because I was bridging both sides of that all the time, audiology and SLPs at Wendell Johnson, other places like UIHC, so I've worked with them through neurology, otolaryngology, psychiatry, um, Dr. Kathy Matthews and her team here um, rel relative to the Wellstone District Lycanopathy Grant. Um, Kevin Campbell and Dr. Kathy Matthews lead that and a wonderful team of nursing professionals that are researchers and helpers and people extraordinaire um, that I've had an opportunity to walk, work with for many years. Uh, my music therapy colleague, Kate Gefeller back there, we started with summer residential program. I think we did about 20 summers of that. And she's worked with me also the last 17 summers in our listen and speak up program for um, young children with hearing loss. So we go way back, Kate. And so I've developed a very uh, strong appreciation for Kate, her wonderful research in terms of music therapy and to see her skills and her students. It's been a, it's been a joy to do that. We've also have colleagues here from the REACH program. So way back, 
Uh, 10 years ago, we had the first uh, contact with that program and they asked me to try to facilitate, try to lead that, to make those connections. And these are students in the College of Education who have cognitive and or learning sort of disabilities, many of them on the autism spectrum. And many of them have communication problems and we have worked with them uh, to try to facilitate their ability to move forward in their life with their um, school and with work. Um, I got lots of students, so I added it up. I've had about 950 graduate students in speech language pathology that I've worked with and about 375 audiology students. Hundreds of graduate students have sat right next to me and it is never quiet in my observation room. I'm usually meh, 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 telling them what they're seeing, telling them what, what questions do you have. Um, I've taught many different kinds of classes, so I've had classrooms full of undergraduates and graduate students in various levels uh, across, the, um, across the years, many years. Okay, this is the best. So clients and their families. So that little girl on the left, um, always when she was mischievous, looked over her glasses that way. <laughs> so right when she peered over, you knew it was going to go south. And um, so, uh, but she was a dear one that I worked with for many years. And this was the last client that I worked with just about a week and a half ago, um, who will be uh, moving forward with other uh, therapy programs here. She was adopted um, from China when she was six years old and five years, 10 months, but almost six years old and was told that maybe she couldn't learn and um, they weren't sure that she would ever be able to do anything. And I'm proud to report I said not on my watch okay where because it could tell she had this just this spark and um Stacy will know if Stacy's here that that um she was just a, a, a you know a live little thing and so now she's reading and it's we're at two years later and she's learning a lot she has got a lot of things she still needs to work on but that's how she looks every day when you meet and work with her every single day like that and she always opens with how are you <laughs> um and this kind of little high voice um her parents are eternally grateful so um oh i look somber over there that julie you put in that picture um I, I sometimes we get recorded or you know for thing various things so these are different kinds of programs we used to have kid talk preschool here for almost 20 years all students went through that so they began with their preschool practicums including the audiology students much to their horror um, we've had reach programs. We had a preschool once for children with hearing loss only for two, two semesters. I think it was hard to continue to fund that. Um, we've had these uh, programs for younger children under five um, going on 17 years now. So I've run those programs along with esteemed colleagues, Danny, Stephanie, now Julie Gian, and um, Megan, I'm not sure where Megan is, but um, Megan will be um, carrying on for me and give it her own stamp. And so that'll be great. Um, we used to do lots of general diagnostics across the lifespan. Um, now our, our program is really focused more on individual areas. So it, uh, 25 years ago, I was doing neuro evaluations and was doing a voice evaluation, was doing all different disorders. And now we have kind of specialties that we are all um, doing. Um, so I tried to make good on my promises uh, to my students. Um, and I hope I did at least to mo model professional integrity in what I did. Um, be knowledgeable, don't, don't come into my, uh, my uh, class in, and if I ask you about something and you should know it about your patient and you said, oh, I was too tired. I didn't get to read that last night. You'll only say that once. And um, then I will remind you that I'm tired too and older and you need to read it. And so that's, that's, our, um, that's our commitment to and that's what we should be doing professionally for people. Um, always show compassion. So these families that come in and it doesn't matter what age they are, they they are, they struggle with a lot of things. Um, their child might have multiple disabilities. They might have multiple disabilities. They might be going from provider to provider to provider, hoping someone has a magic formula to help them. Um, so you got to remember that there's something positive that they can do, and you better find it. You better look for it, and I will help you look for it if, if I was your um, um, supervisor. I am all about respecting the culture and language and learning differences. 
Um, we, we, we need to do that. We, we need to do that now more than ever in the world, I would say. And we have to look at the providers that are doing that as well as our graduate students. Our graduate students come in with various kinds of learning differences and backgrounds and cultures. And so we need to be mindful of that and, and uh, be able to, to help them with that. Um, I've tried to teach my students to choose your words in spoken and written form carefully. I learned that way back from my dad and early growing up, but choose your words carefully because they can change someone's life. Okay, example. Here's an initial diagnosis story. Diane, maybe you'll know this. We had a little girl, six months old, uh, that came in a two physician family at UIHC. Both physicians were trilingual in different languages. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of languages in their home. We diagnosed this child. This child was profoundly deaf. And uh, we had to tell the family that this child is profoundly deaf. And um, so we have, we, you know, teach our graduate students how to say that. That's hard to say. That's, that's a scary thing. Here's what the family might do. They might cry. They might do this. Um, and the, the mother said nothing. And the father said one thing. And as long as I live, I will never forget it. Um, and you might think he said, well, you know, what can I do to help, et cetera? The, this is the question the father asked. Will she be able to learn calculus? <laughs> okay, now, and, and I, that's the kind of reaction that almost that my students gave. So like, are, are you kidding me? Like, that's what you wanna ask about now? But Diane and I looked at each other and I, I said, do you wanna go or do you want me to go? And, I, and so she said, you go. I said, okay. <laughs> Uh, because our students did the very same thing. They were like, huh, like, well, is, you know, these people are wacko. Like, are you kidding me? But here's what they were saying. You just shot my whole view of my kid. Okay. Cause I, my kid was going to learn all these languages and my kid was probably going to be a physician like me and certainly be a professional. And what I know to be the case is they'd have to have a higher level of language skills to be able to do that. And now I don't know if they'll ever talk or, or whatever, okay? So they weren't saying anything about calculus. And so what I, and I usually use this as a, as a teaching example in class and I'll say like, what would you say? What's the first thing you're gonna say? Because words are powerful now that you tell them, they are very powerful. Okay, if you say like, oh, are you kidding me? Calculus, you're worried about that now? Okay, you can't say that to them, right? You cannot say that. So. What I said was, Diane looked at me and we, we did our little, okay, you go. And um, I said, I have no idea what your child's mathematical potential will be. But what I do know is math is a language, okay? And if you get language into your child, they might have the potential to do calculus or any number of things, okay? But, but and that was enough. Okay, and this, this person went on to be very successful. I think the latest I heard was, I think she is either in medical school or a residency. And so it, had a, it has a good ending. Um, I tell my students, you can't walk in their shoes, but by God, help them get on the path. Okay, help, you don't know, you can't walk with them, but you can help them be better. And you can make it easier for them. You can collaborate with others. If they have an idea, try it as long as it's not, you know, too old. You can try things. You gotta be open to new ideas. You gotta learn to advocate. Those of us that do clinic regularly, we are always, <laughs> you guys right there, we are always like arguing with insurance. Okay, who's gonna argue today? Like insurance, insurance, because we are always advocating for our patients, Kathy. I mean, it's, it doesn't, doesn't, nothing's free and nothing's always easy. And so we are always constantly trying to advocate for them not just in provision of services, but in, in other ways as well. Um, flexibility is usually a strength, okay? So that you can try something that a parent suggests that gives them some sense of, of feeling of credibility. Um, it's helpful to be a lifelong learner. If those of you in graduate school now think, oh, please God, let me get through this in the next two years and I'm out of here and I am done learning, I would be nowhere where I am now. OK, I've had to keep on learning every day, every day. You learn something new from the people that are around you. And um, and if you have anything involved with technology, you have to keep learning because it's changing all the time. Like AAC, like all the time, something is changing. 
Um, have patience with yourself. I always say humor is useful. I like humor. Um, I use humor a lot to help people um, kind of soften things a little bit. Um, humor had to be pretty good. Poor Josh back there, our IT person had to use, he probably had to use a lot of humor with me because I'm not really good with this. And in um, COVID was a disaster, wasn't it, Josh, kind of? Well, borderline. But he, I would always say, he would say, can you share your screen? Yeah, baby, here, you have at it, Josh, and do whatever you need to, because I was not, it was just too, too difficult to do. So you had to learn, it, those times were difficult. Um, it, was, it was harder to do lots of things. Okay, my clients and my patients, I learned something new every day from them. It informed my practice in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Um, it gave students an opportunity. So you students in the audience are learning because someone is allowing themselves to be open to you for training and teaching purposes. Um, and you'll get lifelong connections from some of these things. Um, I got so many stories, it's kind of crazy, okay? Because when you've done, when you've been behind a, a, a wall looking in or teaching or whatever you've been doing, the stuff happens. A lot of stuff happens. And not just bodily fluid stuff, but other stuff happens. And so I want to, so the, the suggest or the, the cases that I'm going to show are not um, tied into any, the, the names that I'm using are not their names. Um, okay. So um, here we are. This is kind of where we hang out. There's Danny in the middle. I don't know who's on the left there, Danny, but I'm on the right. And the, we are looking through the window at a at preschool uh, hearing impaired class going on here. So this is why you sometimes want us in the room, okay? Coming up to these examples, this is why. Okay, the Helen Keller moment, one of my favorites. Um, we had a little five-year-old, I'll call him John. Um, and he, he was, had wore hearing aids, wore them early on. We know that's a good thing to wear them, was not talking, nothing. It was like we were, we, he, we would give information, nothing, 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 no naming, no sounds, nothing was coming out. He's five, five years old. That's like late to begin, uh, you know, talking. And so I kept telling my students, it's going to come, it's going to come, let's, you know, just be patient, it's going to come. And one day we were in there and Helen Keller, if you've ever watched that movie, at one point she goes to the well and she puts water over hand and goes, wah, wah, okay, for water, okay. Um, so this kid had his Helen Keller moment. He's just in the room and he just like, it all came to him. It like started working and he just points and he goes, book. And then he went floor and nose and just must have named 25 things like just all in a row. Student starts weeping. Okay. Tears, <laughs> tears are running down her face. And all she can say is, cause we're not always in there every single minute is, are you in there, Anne? <laughs> um, you know, and, and I knocked back on the door quietly. The signal is, I got gotcha. you. Yep, yeah, I'm in here. That, it's okay. So that was a pretty cool thing. When you see that happen in connection, it's, it's really amazing. Um, in the mid 80s, uh, we had a little guy that came in, a five year old. I'll call him Nick. That's not his name either. Um, and I had two graduate students and one in audiology because this child also was not talking, was five years old, but seemed to be able to hear everything. They weren't questioning whether he was hearing. And at, at this moment, maybe none of you know this movie, but there was a movie that came out, I think in 1985 called Rain Man. And it starred um, Dustin Hoffman as a person with autistic savant syndrome and his cagey, mean, conniving brother, Tom Cruise, who used him to uh, do card counting in Las Vegas and make some money, okay? So we weren't doing that card counting, but this little guy, um, and at that point, it was very rare in the mid eighties to see a lot of children with autism. They were not necessarily, I think they were there, out there somewhere, but maybe not in the same way that we see students now with on the autism spectrum. But autistic savant syndrome, even though many students with autism have savant-like skills, uh, savant syndrome is a, is a little bit unique that way. So um, this little guy, this time I was not in the observation room, but I was on the floor kind of playing with him. And I had your basic things. Let's see, what is he like? I'll get some cars, I'll get some books. And, and the students were interviewing the parents. 
And uh, the, so they were asking, and they said, well, uh, does he talk at all? Well, sometimes he talks, but what does he talk about? And dad leans down, I'm, I'm playing with the cars there with him. And he said, oh, we can put out 27 cars front to back in a row. And he comes out for one minute and we time him. Then he goes back into the kitchen and says 1974 Pontiac, I won't know these, Le Mans, I mean, whatever cars are. Okay, so he could name the year, the model, and the color of the car. Okay, so those were words. I said, you can understand those words? Yes. But that, but he, if you said, did you have breakfast? He couldn't answer that question. Do you have your shoes on? What's your name? He could answer nothing like that. So I listened to that. And then I was playing with him. And he's lining in the cars right up, lining them up, lining them up. So I irritatingly twi twist a car. Okay. You know, goes crazy. So I was done with the eval, but um, the students needed to learn a little more. So um, we needed to continue with that kind of evaluation. And so they asked the mom, well, what? Um, it, I, you came and, and they said he's gifted. This child is gifted because he could read. He could read when he was two. And so I know my student wrote, you know, read two. And so I said, ask him what he reads. Ask him what he reads. So, interesting that you asked that. He can only read one thing. I said, what is it? She said, the Isuzu dealerships in the phone book. Now that's a little narrow focus, okay? And so it turns out this kid periodically, every few months, had a new sort of savant ability that he had. And the current one, when we were evaluating him, was flags. So somewhere it exists on a tape. Well, actually, it's purged by now. Me, I went through uh, oh, hundreds of countries. But there is somewhere that says, Nick, two more and you can draw. Lithuania. <laughs> so I, I, I was I was baiting him along with um, various kinds of, of um, I got a little mixed up in the Kazakhstan's. I got a little confused there, but okay, unexpected behaviors. Um, and this is, or do I need career counseling? This is one of my favorite stories. Um, <laughs> this this student did actually finish in speech language pathology, but it, I mean, bless her heart, it was tough. Okay, so we had a deaf blind, cognitively impaired woman in her late 20s that came into our building. And she was working on various kinds of things and communicated in Tadoma. So we would finger spell words in her hand. So how are you all of those individually and she could then interpret that based on what we were saying because she couldn't see she couldn't hear and, and the implant or hearing aids were not uh, appropriate for her. Um, so I said, you've got to keep her hands busy because if Mary's and Mary's not her name, Mary's hands are not busy. She sometimes reportedly will pop her one eye out, her eye prosthetic, <laughs> eye prosthetic, a, a prosthetic. Okay. Yeah. Not a real eyeball. Okay. So I, so the student was, you know, doing her thing and, and working and she had Mary kind of going here pretty soon, but she was, then she re reached forward the student to write down something. And I looked in there and I like, no, like, no, here she goes. And so sure enough, finger goes up there boop, and quick as a bunny out pops the eyeball and it goes blow glump, blow glump, blow glump all the way across the table and onto the floor. Okay, so now I, we got to get the eyeball back, but I've got a traumatized student, really seriously traumatized. So she looks like it completely frozen. So I knocked on the window because I knew it wouldn't disturb the other client because she couldn't hear that, but she didn't even budge. She's like, just like frozen. So then I went out into the hallway, laid on the ground in the hallway. And I go, whatever the student's name was, like Jennifer. Okay, look behind you and find the eyeball. Because <laughs> I I couldn't I couldn't open the door to go in and help her till because I didn't want it to be in the, you know, in the pathway of the door. So she couldn't. So then I go back in, she's still frozen. So I go, okay, okay Jennifer, look over your right shoulder and see if you see the eyeball. Well, no, in there. So I knew I could creep in. Luckily, I'm small. And then I got in, got it behind them, and I was furious. I like went to Mary and I'm like. Don't you ever do that again? Like, I mean, in her poor little hand, because I mean, she shouldn't have done that. And um, then she got me instead of the nice student for the rest of the session there, because the student was, you know, she needed CPR nearly. <laughs> it, it was not good. Okay. Um, 
this is probably the last example I'll talk about. We have a 911 here. Okay, one time uh, we had an older gentleman in his 70s and he had lost his hearing because uh, he had been in a fight with a buddy from work. Okay, and he fell off something, whatever, a landing or something, cracked his cochleas, which are where your ear organ is, and he was profoundly deaf. So he had got one cochlear implant, which he hated at 70. Okay, so he, we were working with him. I always encourage my students, well, when you're at the end of the session, you know, just ask him a little bit, like, what are you going to do, you know, not tomorrow? What are you going to do this weekend? And he said, I'm so glad you asked that. And so um, he said, well, I'm gonna take um, your, my buddy out, buddy that had knocked him off the building and made lots into, we're gonna go fishing. Like, ooh, okay. So um, he said, I'm gonna have a rope and some bricks and, um, and my fishing equipment. And so now I, there was a student observing an undergraduate and I said, go get the clinic director right now. Go down and get the clinic director. She says, I want to hear how it ends. I said, no, get out of here. So, uh, so they, we go down and the clinic director comes up. And so he had this plotted out, like we're going to like land the big one and then poof, and into the drink he was going to go. So like, uh, and the poor, again, the graduate student, like you can't plan that somebody's going to plot a murder like during your session. So you cannot plan for every kind of contingency event. Okay. Um, I want to tell one campus encounter, um, CAN bus encounter, just because, oh, here it is. Okay. In the CAN bus world, see this? I'm a legend. They told me I was a legend. And here's why. I was walking to work, minding my own beeswax, and um, uh, down that lane, what is that, Hawkeye Lane? What's it called there? No, not Hawkins Drive, but... Um, Oh, the Hawkeye Drive between, um, between the hospital and, and, and the parking lot back there? Yeah. So I, Yavashevsky, okay. So I was just walking along, walking along, and a car or a bus was coming from UIHC going way too fast, and a bus was coming from the other place going way too fast, and I was right at the intersection on the sidewalk, and I thought, they're going to crash. But luckily the woman coming, the woman driving the bus from UIHC saw me there on the sidewalk, did try to avoid me, but she dukes of hazarded the huge cam bus up in the air through that brick wall of which I got a piece of, okay? Again, no cell phones, it's just me and the bus full of people and the poor girl who with her mouth like that. So, so I go over the rubble and get everybody out of the bus because I thought, what if it blows up? You know, you've seen the movies. So like, like, get them off. So I got them off the bus and the girl had to, like, she was in shock, the driver. So we got her out and had her sit down. And by then the police had, you know, kind of come. But I remember coming into work and our secretary goes, because I was late. I was half an hour late and I was never late. She said, let me guess, you were on the bus. I mean, because I always had weird things happening. I said, no, but I was right there. And so apparently... Over the years, they told the story. There was this woman who helped everybody get off the bus <laughs> and, and helped to try to treat the woman, get her to the you know, ER. And I said, that was me. You know, because she said, where'd you get that brick? And um, anyway, so that there used to be a, a, parking, a parking or a Hawkeye place there. So, all right, going forward, we'll just get, see what's coming. What's next for the department? A continued tradition of research, teaching, and service. We have challenges in meeting goals of diversity, equity, inclusion, what the rest of the country has to do. We as a profession really have worked hard on that. Our students have worked super hard on that. We're very proud of their efforts. We have a new colleague joining us, um, Megan Foodie. And so we're eager to have her and we've got clinical programming that's already strong, but can, can of course always be stronger or different or better. So we have a lot of, lot of things happening there. Um, what's next for me? The short answer is no clue. I don't know for sure. Um, I will continue my professional con um, uh, kind of obligations as well as connections, the Wellstone project here with Kathy Matthews. Um, I've got some of an advisory role also with Beth on a grant and um, uh, also Dr. Gefeller relative to 
um, music therapy kind of thing. Um, I like to, I want to connect with my family and friends more often. I want to travel. I want to Benny sit. So I have a new grandson named Benjamin and I'm calling those Ben Ventures. Um, and so I want to see my family more and do more things. So um, my husband and I were going, there's my husband of 42 years. Yay us. Um, <laughs> Uh, we were going to go to Scotland. He likes scotch. Um, he's, he's practicing over there. Um, he's practicing in that picture, but we, we can't go now, obviously. And um, here we are at Lake Louise. He likes, we like to bike. <laughs> we like to bike and sometimes we get wounded. Um, these are my wonderful kids. My son, Jake, his girlfriend, Courtney, who I've been seeing for a year and a half. Um, so I'm looking forward to being able to see him. Um, and then the little joy of our life here coming up here, since we didn't get to see Benjamin really the first almost four months of his life, we're celebrating everything. I don't know what this was, Daz, maybe six months, six months, seven months, Tuesday, we celebrate everything now. Um, so that's my son, Dan, his lovely wife, and my daughter-in-law, Dazzy, Carolyn Wallace, and then my daughter, Hannah, again, the little guy, he gets in the pictures. Um, and um, then I wanted to tell so my dad so there there's my dad uh, he's 97 and he's watching today he fell so he couldn't be here today but anyway my uh extremely generous sister meg thompson and my brother-in-law dr brad thompson um he is yeah, this is his 97th birthday here in march and they have endowed in perpetuity two scholarships in the College of Business for the best communication skills. So, so, so he was, he was very, he's, he developed the first um, uh, business communication course at the university uh, 50 years ago, and it's still required and still taught. Obviously changed a little bit, but he was all about communication. And I think he can communicate with this little guy. Um, so there's Benjamin. And I'm gonna take some flat, some pictures. I like to do gardening and I'm always much to my children's horror taking, <laughs> taking pictures. And um, so in gratitude, I'm gonna read this because otherwise I won't get through it. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be here today to my treasured colleagues for your professional contributions to my learning, your expertise, your patience at my relentless questions, your kindness in the ups and downs of personal and professional life to my students for challenging me to be my best to teach them and permitting my gregarious passion a place to be heard, to my clients and their families for allowing me to be part of their journey and to my family and friends who've supported me through it all. And there you go, off I go. I know we gotta, I tried to do it quick because I know they got, they're coming in class. I knew she would bring down the house. Um, I think we have, I think Danny wants to come say, Danny, are you here? And I knew. Oh, can we just pull this up? Quick. Uh oh! I see. Should I I'll get out? There. Should I get out? Should I go stay, sit? You can stay here. Stand I just, here. I'm gonna let Josh Sorry, do Caroline, this. So, the yeah, intro so people. Nobody after you. Okay. Nobody's after. You. Oh, nobody else. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so on behalf of the clinical faculty in audiology and speech language pathology, we just wanted to say some few quick words to Anne as she starts on this new journey in her life. So, you know, you've always given so much time above and beyond what anyone else has in a given work week um, for your students and for your patients and for your friends and fam, well, for your friends. What we want to say now is that it's time for you to take time for you. And we lifted some of your pictures from Facebook, <laughs> so you might recognize these. We want you to take time for Bill and the rest of your family for all your hobbies that you love now and for those that you're, are yet for you to mm -hmm. discover. 
So we want to say thanks for being our teacher, because for a lot of us, you are our teacher. And then next, our colleague. No, it's scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we want to thank you for all the lessons that you've taught us. Um, and we want to say that the way you've influenced our, um, the way we teach and the way we take care of patients and, and do our clinical care, that will continue to influence both of those for years to come. And then Stephanie wants to make sure everybody knows that you will always still be a Hawkeye. And we'll miss you. And we will miss your humor, your stories, as many of them we heard today. And I'm sure there's many more. Maybe you should become a moth storyteller, and like travel and do stories. We will miss your kindness, your compassion. Um, I think you were the one person from clinic the clinical educators who probably knew everyone's clients, met everyone in the waiting room, talked to anyone that walked in and made everyone feel welcome. We'll miss you a lot, um, but we wish you, I mean, you'll always be here. We'll find you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy retirement. <laughs> Okay, and you didn't think you were going to get out of here with Diane and I got <laughs> standing up here. It's you? not good. It's not good. <laughs> no, I just want to be Anne and Diane and I are the trio that go back to the very beginning. We've lived through every part of our life, professionally and personally, for all 37 years. And um I know you really, the most important thing has always been for you to make a difference and you've made more than a difference. So thanks from everyone. Yeah, and not every audiologist hated taking those practicums. I loved it. <laughs> you were a weirdo, Diane. I know, I still am a weirdo, but that's why my speech pathology friends are some of my best friends. So. Mm -hmm. We're going a little over here if anybody is watching, but I think we have some, I, Julie, we have somebody who online. Oh, we're going to have Josh come up here. This is again over my pay grade. Can I help you, Josh? No. <laughs> You know, they're still teaching in my class, right? Yeah, I know. Okay, good. I'm going to save those. <laughs> Boy, who is it? Who is wanting to ask a question? Ooh. Oh, I don't want to stop share. What do I want to do? Oh, thank you, people. Who is it? Hi, Richard. Oh, he can't hear me. Oh, maybe he can. Hi, Richard. Richard, I bet Richard wants. I bet Richard wants to talk. If I know Richard, Richard I talk? bet he wants to talk. Oh, he's muted. Oh, oh. I no, I I, I I was muted so I wouldn't interrupt you because you know I often do that. Uh, and uh, you, do. Uh, you did a spectacular job today, and you did a spectacular job all of these years. Uh, you broke me in as a faculty member. You were my first honor student, and I think that I learned as much from you. Uh, as from a lot of students and everything I said in that letter uh, that I didn't realize still existed uh, was absolutely true. And um, I wish you all the best for all the fun you're going to have. Uh, but I know you and you're going to keep your finger in a lot of pies. So uh, mm -hmm. congratulations. And yeah. once again, I love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Julie, were there others? I'm, I wasn't watching the chat. Hey, Jan Mark. Julie Jones. Oh. Okay. Hi, Barb. My roommate from college. Oh, do I do something, Josh? Look. Oh. Oh, my gosh. It's the man of the day. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear your story? Yeah, I did. I'm the I'm the I'm the I'm the person with the animals. 
And uh, I, I want to say, Annie, so that, that I know frogs do talk different languages in different countries. Yeah. I didn't know that until I come to the States. And it does help. I mean, I, when I just came, I couldn't differentiate R versus L. It, the, the, those two sounds are very difficult for me. Even now, it's still very difficult. And uh, we, we, and and taught me I can try to mimic some animal sounds. So we go to the cows and horse <laughs> and, and the dogs actually gave me the the raw the R sound. And that 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 dog R sound really changed my pronunciation of uh, my tongue. Well, what in a totally different shape before. But I do want to say a big thank you in, in person online because I do remember those days in with you. And uh, I, I still remember I went home and recall my own voice uh, talking the animal languages and then listen to my voice and try to correct my speech from there. And uh, I, it, I cannot thank you enough because it really is it's, uh, it's an adventure. And, and I will remember you for a long time and I wish you a wonderful retirement. I, I believe there will be uh, even better uh, a lot of better things you would do after that. Thank you. And I'm the frog person. <laughs> I also want to, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. I, nice, Thanks, really sir. nice seeing you all again, Diane, Carolyn. I remember you all, Stephanie. You all helped me a lot in the clinic and in the lab, in the school. And uh, I, yeah, I just, I'm getting always well. So I probably will have my retirement soon. <laughs> Thank you for Jen. Thank you for Jen. We go downstairs now? Or? Yeah, okay. I, I, there, a few oh. years ago. Okay, and we have a couple of gifts for you. We have some flowers and a couple of gifts for you. Well, have, but maybe we will bring them down, downstairs okay. and probably open. Be good. We, we do have, you know what, let's just open one here. Okay. So we have one from the department basically here. A, and it's, it's did nothing. you wrap it, TB? I did. Well, no, actually, Julie did, but she said it's very easy to unwrap. Okay, easy to unwrap. It's from the department. Yeah, yeah. And okay. you, it's going to take you a while to read that. Oh, okay. All right. But, yeah. Don't want to lose my brick. No. Harder with this hoof. Hmm. My bestie. Oh, the medical campus. Yeah. yeah. We hope. Oh, thank you. That's had, very nice. I had a student at a. And there's one, Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a picture on my wall that someone, one of our students, former students, painted of Wendell Johnson's speech and hearing building, which I love in my office. And this I thought would be yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Thank as well, you very so. much. And, and the student's mother. Well, she was an SLP. Student. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you know yeah, that? The no, artist. I didn't know that, oh, actually. The artist, yeah, the artist mother. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we hope you'll all join us downstairs. We have some hors d'oeuvres and we can help Anne celebrate, give her a big hug socially, carefully. <laughs> and, and we will um, continue downstairs. And we completely understand if you're not comfortable with that. We just sort of um, very happy to see everybody here today. For my students, I already got her signed up to continue to talk in my class. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, Anne. Everybody. One more time.